if you want to write beautiful mathematics, if you want to make documents that are full of math equations, the standard and best way to do this is using LaTeX. LaTeX is a markup language, and what that means is that there's a whole bunch of code that you write down. It looks messy, but don't worry, it's not so bad. I'm going to show you exactly how to do it. And what it does is it converts that into beautiful documents like this one that nicely display complicated mathematical expressions and allow you to just really tightly control exactly how you want to display mathematics. Now, this is actually my second LaTeX video. My first video was the very introduction for absolute beginners. And in this video, I'm going to show you a bunch of tips and tricks that build on that previous video and basically tell you everything you need to know to be able to write your homeworks or your projects or whatever else using LaTeX. Now, before you can actually write any LaTeX, you have to have some software that allows you to convert from the code to the mathematics. And the one that I think overwhelmingly is the best is Overleaf. Overleaf is a web-based editor. You just go to overleaf.com, you make an account, and you can just start working in LaTeX. Everything just sort of exists in the cloud. Now, I've used Overleaf for years. I've recommended it to my students and to you on YouTube for years. So that's why I'm very proud that for the first time, I'm actually being officially sponsored by Overleaf to create this video. And the idea is that we're going to create this little mini series together so that any of you can go from a complete novice at LaTeX to a master at LaTeX over the course of this video series. Where I'm going to start is where I left off on the previous video. That is, I have this little bit of code, and basically all I showed you previously was how to make these different equations. So if this seems completely foreign, go and check out the previous video to that. The link is down in the description. So the first thing I'm going to do is perhaps the easiest, it's the low-hanging fruit, is I want to show you how to do basic formatting. So as you might notice, I have these three definitions of E. I have a limit, I have a sum, and a continued fraction. Perhaps I want to put different types of emphases on those. Okay, so let's imagine first that I want to take this limit that I have and I want to make that boldface. First thing I can just do is double click on that limit and Overleaf is really nice. It takes the cursor on the left hand side to precisely that location. So here I have it in the code as a limit. Now what I'm going to type is a very common structure in LaTeX. I'm going to go backslash and then I'm going to go text BS, so text boldface, left curly brace and finally right curly brace. We do this all the time in LaTeX, as in backslash some command, and then we put the object inside of curly braces. If I click recompile, then what happens? Well, that limit is now bolded. It won't always be this command. You might have other commands beyond just text boldface. We're going to see many in this video. But this is the type of thing. You wrap the object that you're interested in converting in some way in curly braces with some sort of command on the front, in this case, backslash text bf. Now, there's actually another way to have done this, so maybe I'm going to try to go for the sum, but this time I'm going to try to make it italics. I could instead have gone up here to rich text. Rich text is adding extra menus. This is all Overleaf, not LaTeX itself. This is sort of a one of the reasons why it's so convenient to use Overleaf, because I can just come here and I can select the sum and I can use the I button, the italics button, and if I go back to the source, What's happening here? It's put in backslash text IT, which is the code for italics. If I recompile it, I'm going to have my sum now be italicized. So it's up to you whether you want to memorize the commands like backslash text BF or backslash text IT, or if instead you prefer the contextual menu, this rich text menu that was created by Overleaf. It's a little bit up to you. I'll do one more. This one is not on the menu. This is backslash underline. Again, there's a left brace and a right brace and the continued fraction is inside of there. And as you can imagine, backslash underline is just going to underline the continued fraction. So that's how you do some very simple formatting. What I want to do next is play around with equations. I want to make better equations. I want to make fancier equations because the three that I have right now are relatively simple. I'm going to just observe that the way I made the three right now was that I put an equation when it's in its own environment, what we call a display math environment, so it's sort of own line, and basically all of this code is in between a two different backslash left square bracket and backslash right square bracket. Instead of the square brackets, I can do the following. I'm going to go backslash, begin equation, and same at the end, I'm going to go backslash end equation. Very similar idea, nothing about the actual equation in the middle, E is equal to a limit of blah, 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 blah. I showed you how to do all of that formatting in the previous video. But when I recompile it, one thing does change. 
The thing that changes is that on the right hand side now there is this one and basically what's happening as soon as you go and begin equation it now starts to number the equations. If I did this for each one it would become two and three and so forth. So if you have a long document with many different equations you want to refer back to an equation well the begin equation allows you to have a numbering system. But there's an even better way to refer to it. Maybe I want to say that equation one was really cool something like that. Now I could do that but because I manually typed one here, if I then make some changes to my documents, like I add a new equation, then the number's not gonna be pointing to the right thing. So I'm gonna go to my begin equation, and I'm gonna do something called backslash label here, and maybe I'll call this limit because this equation is a limit. Now, if I execute at this point, if I recompile at this point, nothing changes because all I was doing was creating this label that was internal to LaTeX. It, it's not displayed in any way. But now what I can do is in place of writing equation one where I manually type one, I'm gonna go backslash reference, as in I'm gonna reference my label and I'm gonna put in the name of it, which was limit. All right, so nothing's gonna change when I do it. I'll, I'll go and do this exact thing. And what do I have is equation one. What's relevant here is that this equation one wasn't me literally typing the number one it's that because I referred to the limit, and right now that limit equation was the first equation in my document, it spits out the number one. And I want to do a little bit more. So let me suppose that uh, I have E, which is this one limit. I'm going to do another limit. So I'm going to do backslash lim for another limit sign. Underneath the limit, so I'm going to do underscore, and I'm going to put a left and right brace to put something down beneath it. I'm going to do T backslash two, which makes a little bit of an arrow and zero. And then I'm going to put in brackets one plus T. And then this is all to the power of an exponent. So I'll put the exponent sign and then another set of braces. And then I'm gonna put a fraction in here to do fraction that I do backslash frac. And then I'm gonna do one on the top and T on the bottom. And if I compile that, then what I get is the limit as T goes to zero of one plus T all to the power of one over T. This is just another limit that is also equal to E. However, I sort of don't like it. You'll notice that even though my equation in my LaTeX code here, I have it on one line and the other, the LaTeX code doesn't understand returns as something meaningful in this context, inside of an equation environment. It, it sort of ignores this, this white space that is. So what I can do in instead is not use an equation environment, but use something called a line. And a line allows us to, well, align multiple equations. So I'm gonna go align up here and I'm gonna end my align. So instead of calling it an equation, it's now called an align. And I have to do one other thing to make this work. At the end of the first line, to indicate that that line has indeed ended, I'm gonna do backslash, backslash, and that lets LaTeX know that that's the end of the line. And the final thing I'm gonna do is just delete this label because I've got two different equations going on here. I don't need to have that label any longer. I hit recompile and let's see what happens. All right. Now I have two different equations, one and two here, and they occur on top of each other vertically. Like, I don't really like that the equal sign here and the equal sign there are sort of offset. I, I want them to be nicely aligned. So you can do one further trick. In this first equation where it says E equal to, I'm gonna put an ampersand, and then down here in front of this equals, I'm gonna put another ampersand. And notice how right now the equal signs are away from each other. As soon as I put that ampersand in the same spot right before the equal signs, it lines them up. It's kind of like having two different columns in a table and that ampersand says, well, where are you gonna split? What are you gonna put in the first column? What are you gonna put in the second column? So basically it's saying we're splitting this equation at the place where this ampersand is. We'll line up all the ampersands and stuff to the left and stuff to the right is gonna be separated accordingly. So for example, uh, there is no left-hand side of the equation on the bottom one, but maybe I'll write in some text. By the way, to make text, you go backslash text. Otherwise, in the middle of an equation, it's gonna look a little bit weird. Uh, how about this, uh, like and subscribe, just need something which is long, <laughs> could be anything, I'll just choose that one. And notice what happens again. The equal signs are aligned, and the stuff to the left of it is sort of spread on either side of that alignment, of either side of those two equal signs. And I get these nice two equations, one and two. Now, you might be thinking, okay, that's great, but I actually don't want this to be thought of two different equations, one and two. I really would have preferred it to be thought of just one equation, and I could give it that single reference like I was doing before. Okay, how do we do that? Well, 
very similar to a line. I'm actually going to go right back to equation where I was at before, begin equation and end equation. So I'll have the same sort of structure. But now what I do is use something called split. I'm going to go begin split. And I'm going to go end uh, split as well. So everything else is exactly the same. The ampersands are the same. The end of the lines are the same. It's just instead of being wrapped by begin and end of line, it's, be, it's being wrapped by begin equation, begin split, and finally end split, end equation. Look what we get. Visually the exact same thing, but there is now one reference here. There's sort of, this is thought of as basically one equation. I could give it a label. I could reference that label in exactly the same way. Okay, I'm gonna do one final thing for funky equations. I'm gonna go down to the second point where this is as a sum here, and I'm gonna try a new different equation. I'm gonna do begin, and by the way, this is something very cool about how Overleaf works, is you'll notice I haven't yet typed all of begin equation, but it's popping out what the different possibilities are, and as soon as I hit the first one, begin equation, it automatically actually fills out the other half of it, the end equation. And so it's kind of convenient because it allows you to just to save on your typing. You don't have to write as much. You just do begin and then you think about the different options. If you get the first queue up, you just hit enter and it fills out all of the structures. So this is a real nice time-saving way to do it. And this is again, all something sort of overly adds on top of LaTeX just to make it easier for you. Now I'm gonna put in, I've copied and pasted it, a big, long, messy expression here. And if I compile it, let's just see what we get. Well. Do you see how annoying that is? This is just the expansion for e to the x here, the first 13 terms. But it's like, it's going too long. That reference to equation two is like overlapping. There's just not quite enough space. So if you have that scenario, your equation's too long, you can fix that by instead of doing begin equation, you do instead malt line. This is for like multiple lines and similarly end malt line. And then to do this, to figure out there's a split, somewhere in the middle you have to do that same trick that we've done before, the double slash, which indicates, tells LaTeX this is the end of a line. Okay, so if I recompile this, notice how it just sort of nicely splits down into two different lines. It takes up the total width, but it sort of jiggers it over top of each other and just automatically deals with how to display it really nicely. Maybe you're starting to get a bit of a sense of the kind of precise control that LaTeX allows you to do and why mathematicians go to it. Yes, you have to learn this little bit of code, but then your control afterwards is fantastic. All right, next topic I wanted to go to. Let's in fact start an entire new section. The fact that we had definition of E as one section, that was our first section. I'm gonna do a new section and I'm gonna call it more tricks. Pop it out and there, got that more tricks. And what I'm gonna begin with is by making a table. I wanna show you how to make tables. So I begin as I so often do with backslash begin and let's just see what happened if I start typing table. Ah, there we have this nice table environment and we're gonna get table but I'm actually gonna begin with the second on the list which is tabular. Double click on this and it puts out a whole bunch of very standard formatting. So, so what's going on with the standard formatting? Well, begin tabular and tabular that makes and closes the environment as you can expect. This thing at the top in times of braces that it goes C vertical line C this basically says, have it be centered and then create a vertical line down the middle of the table and then be centered again. And likewise, in the middle here, you see though there's placeovers like blank and blank and the line, blank and blank. Exactly like we were seeing before when we were doing these sort of arrays is that the and separates the different columns of the table and that the double backslash ends it. So maybe I could say, how about this? One, two, three, and four it makes this little table one, two, three, and four with this vertical bar right here because it went C vertical bar C. If I wanted more bars, then I could, for example, put a uh, vertical bar to the left and the right of the C, and that would say that you have these columns that are centered and then you want something to the left and the right as well. And then if I also wanted things on the top, we can make horizontal bars by going backslash H line. So I'm gonna do a initial H line at the very top, before there's anything, then I'm gonna do another H line in the middle, and then final H line after everything. Now, here there's a syntax error, and this is good to have this happen because you see how Overleaf tells us this little red error, and it says exactly what you can't do with the sort of H line business, and, it, and you can see it sort of it's screwed up on the right-hand side. I needed to go and end that line before I typed in H line. 
I can fix that nicely, and I have this nice little table that's sort of all surrounded. Final thing I'm going to do is, okay, let's make one that's sort of ridiculously long. I'll put a, a bunch of zeros here. And instead of center, I could go left or right. Maybe in this case, I'm going to go right, just so you can sort of see what's going to happen if I do it. So basically, the left column here, the first one that appears had with the C here, well, that looks perfectly fine, but it's right justified in the second column. Now, I wanted to improve this table in several different ways. The first thing is I don't like that it's sort of stuck here on the left. And so I'm going to do a little trick. I'm going to go begin, and now I'm going to do center. I'm Canadian, I always have to remember to spell it the American way, end center, as you can imagine. If you wrap something in begin center and end center, it's going to put it right there in the center. But I'd like to do more. I'd like to do the same type of thing that I've done before with equations. Like I want to give it a reference so I can refer to this table. I also would like to kind of give it a caption. Like I want to be like, this is table one, and it tells me, you know, whatever the subject of the table is. So I can do that by taking this entire thing between begin center and end center that has this begin tabular and end tabular in the middle and wrap all of that in begin, the other thing that started with T, begin table and end table. But now I can do something like backslash caption and say uh, a nifty table or something like this. And if I compile this, let's see what's going to happen. It's going to be right there and it says table one, a nifty table, and it displays my table. Likewise, I could come here and give it a label, like a uh, label, I don't know what should we call it, nifty table, how about that? Then I can refer to that particular label like I like table, and then whatever it is, uh, reference, and by the way, it's kind of nice. As soon as you do the reference, it pops up all the things you could refer to. So here I've got this nifty table. I can just go and immediately do it. Let's recompile this. And what we see here is I like table one, which is indeed named table one. By the way, there, you can control these things, but right now LaTeX is just finding a nice convenient spot within the page to display this. It doesn't fit within the remaining room on the first page, and there's nothing on the second page. We're just putting it nice in the center in the second page. If there was more text in the second page, it would move around to a logical spot, which is all quite nice. To put this all on the same page, I'm actually going to go and put backslash new page here, right beneath the section more tricks. And if I do that, let's take a moment to compile it. What you'll notice here is that on the new page, you get the table nice at the top, then you get your section and then your reference. I like this table one that's being put up there. So sometimes you can use things like new page to sort of manually force things onto another page if things aren't quite lining up exactly. All right, next up, I want to do something kind of similar to tables. This is adding graphics. And I, I did show this actually in the previous video, but I want to show more elements to it. In particular, I'm going to begin with figure, and again, I'll hit enter, and you can see all the stuff that Overleaf is going to pop up here, a bunch of different things. Now, the main thing is I have to put something in between these braces here for include graphics. So I'm going to pull myself over here and give myself a little bit of space, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to upload a file. So I click upload, and I'm going to select one from my computer. So I, the one I chose was called 100k.png, and so to reference that, I'm going to go 100k. Now, if I try to compile it right now, it actually turns out that there's a bit of a problem. You can see that there's this error here. And the problem is that this thing requires one extra thing to work. If I scroll all the way up the top, I have various packages that can be included, and I need to add one more package, so it has use package, something that, that knows how to deal with graphics. There's several, but I'm going to use GraphicX. As you can see, it sort of automatically pops up again. Now, if I click recompile, it actually knows what's going on. And okay, let's see what happens here. Okay, it's no longer red. This is now going to be, ah, it says overfull, which means it's too big of an image. So this has an overfull horizontal box is the idea. So it doesn't know how to display it. So what I can do here is add a little parameter to it. And parameters I put inside of square brackets, and I'm going to set the width. So I'm going to say the width is equal to backslash the text width. And this is basically saying that I'm going to make the width of the image equal to the same width of which there's space on the page. So there you can see I've got my graphic for when I passed my 100,000 subscribers. And it's exactly the width of that page because I've set the width equal to text width. You can make it half the width of the page or whatever you like. I can also come here and change the caption like I did it. 
I can change the stock label that's put into here to maybe 100K, something like this. And if I do do that, I can say, I am so proud of figure reference. And now you can see there's nifty table like we had before, but there's also the 100K one. Okay, let's compile this and see what happens. I get my images, but it says, I am so proud of figure one, just like I previously had, I like table one. So basically the figure environment works a lot like the table environment. They're just sort of these larger environments that include images, but the actual calling of it is the include graphics, just like how the actual calling of the specific table was that begin tabular. And then you can add the captions, you can add the labels, so you can refer to things and put titles on, all that good stuff. All right, things are moving right along. What I want to do next is talk about theorems, definitions, proofs, lemmas, all of that good stuff that we use all the time in mathematics. Now, what I need to do is a few things to get this going. Basically, I want to create these custom environments to allow me to do theorems and definitions and all those types of things. So I'm gonna use another package. I'll show you a different way to actually add packages. This one is called AMS Theorem, T-H-M. And while we're at it, I'm gonna do AMS fonts as well because I always like to have those three big standard AMS ones. But, but right now we're gonna use AMS theorem. And what I can do again in the preamble, so the preamble of your LaTeX document is everything that occurs prior to the begin document. So I'll just do it up here somewhere. I'm going to define a new theorem. So here's how I do it. I do backslash new theorem. And as you can see already, there's a couple different options that appear here from, from Overleaf giving the standard ones. I'm gonna do the second of these, the ones that takes two different parameters. The first set of braces is how I'm gonna call this environment. So I'll call it theorem. So if I type theorem in anywhere, like begin theorem, then that's gonna use this type of environment. And then the second is what it's gonna be labeled at, what it's gonna look like. And here I'm gonna do capital theorem. I, I care about the capitalization because now people will actually be able to see it. This is gonna do many things. It's gonna create this new environment and it's also gonna deal with things like numbering. So for example, begin a theorem. So I'm gonna go down here into the body and I'm gonna begin my theorem. So the same code that I put in here. And I'm gonna say, uh, you should like and subscribe. Uh, what an excellent theorem and then end theorem. And let's see what happens. So I compile this and what you get is this whole lovely environment. This is our first theorem. So it knows that it's theorem one. And this theorem environment is going to bold face that title, it puts the number in, and then it puts down in italics the body of my theorem. And this is really nice because I can write as many theorems as I want. They're all gonna be stylistically consistent without me having to think about the styles like bolding and italicizing things in different spaces like I was doing before. I just do this every time it will look exactly the same. And it's gonna keep track of the number. I can go if I want, to, if I wanna add a title to this, I can come here and I put my title into square brackets. So maybe I'll call it uh, the YouTube theorem is that you should uh, like and subscribe. And if I do this, it says theorem one and it puts it right there in brackets. So you can always get a sense of what the titles are. Again, a standard formatting that will always occur. I can do the same basic idea. So maybe I'll come here and do another theorem. This one, I won't have a title. Uh, you should like, subscribe. Uh, how about this? Ring the <laughs> notification bell. <laughs> we'll be quite silly about it. And, and what I really want to illustrate here is that the theorem will now be called theorem two. Now, there's one further option though that you might want to consider. I am currently in section two. So if you remember, there was section one here on definitions of E and section two and more tricks. And I've got theorem one and two, but I might want that numbering to be associated with the fact that I'm in section two. So how would I change that? Well, if I go back to the top to where I define this new theorem, I can add one more property and I'm gonna add it inside of square brackets. And this particular parameter is all about at what level are you gonna do the numbering? So if I go and write at the section level, it's gonna number at the section level. I could have done subsection number or many other options, but I'm gonna write section number for now. And now you see if I'm in section two, I have theorem 2.1 and theorem 2.2. It, it starts that first number with whatever section you're in. I can then do something similar. Perhaps I should have a corollary here. So I will go corollary. That's the name by which I call it. Uh, maybe I'll do capitalize. That's not how you spell a corollary. There we go. And I could have corollaries indicated by the section. However, normally if you have a theorem, it has possible many corollaries that come from it. 
So instead of having the numbering based on section, I'm going to have the numbering based on the theorem. Okay, I actually have to go down here and make a corollary. So let's go begin uh, corollary and end corollary. And in the beginning, uh, I'll say and check out Overleaf as well. <laughs> if I compile that, notice what's going to happen. First of all, the name has changed. Like it's a different type of theorem. It's not a theorem, it's a corollary. But second, look at the numbering. It's theorem 2.2.1. And basically the idea of theorem 2.2 occurs, the corollary is associated with theorem 2.2, and I could have many of them, they'd be 2.2.1, 2.2.2, and so forth. Final thing about these theorems is you might be like, hold on Trevor, <laughs> you can't just state theorems, you have to prove them as well. Okay, I will begin my proof. And here I'll say uh, left to the interested uh, subscriber to figure out the proof of that, but let's just take a look at what it looks like. And I have theorem 2.1, the YouTube theorem. It has a proof which is italicized. I have the body of the proof and then on the right hand side, the QED symbol. So again, this, this proof environment always looks like this. It's standardized every single time and it's just associated underneath the theorems. And you can make all sorts of these different environments for other things like, for example, we didn't do lemmas, but you could add one for lemmas or definitions or anything else you so chose. All right, we are getting near to the end, but I want to show you my final trick, one of my favorite things to do. This is all about making entirely new commands, as in not using the standard commands of LaTeX or things that are added by these packages. If you want to make your own command, what do you do? And I actually do this quite often. It's just sort of to save myself a little bit of time. So for example, the real numbers, I'll do an inline equation, so in between two different uh, dollar signs, and the normal way is math BBR. This, by the way, required AMS fonts that we used earlier. Okay, if I compile that, let's take a look at what it looks like. And we have the real numbers and that fancy symbol that we associate to the real numbers. But I hate having to type backslash math BB brace R brace every single time I want to use a symbol because I use it all the time. So one of the things I can do is I can make a little macro that'll, that just sort of shorthands this. So I'll show you how to do it. I go right back up here to where I had those new theorems and I'm gonna make now a new command, backslash new command. It shows you some of the options and I'm gonna use this one here, the middle one with two different parameters. In the first set of braces, I'm gonna put what I'm going to call this command. I'm going to call this backslash r because backslash r is way shorter than backslash math b b brace r brace. But I do have to do this for the final time, backslash math b b uh, brace. I'll put those all in there. And now I have this new shorthand. Just type in backslash r and I get that full thing. I'll show you how it works. Instead of putting this all in, I'll just do backslash r, which previously LaTeX didn't know anything about, didn't know how to deal with it. But, well, it looks exactly the same because I made it look exactly the same. I'm going to show you one more, slightly more complicated type of new command you can make. Imagine I want to make a column vector, something I do in linear algebra all the time. So I could do the following. I could make a begin B matrix. B matrix stands for a bracket matrix. I could then put an A and then a B and then I could end my uh, B matrix and close my environment. And let's just see what happens if I do all of that. Well, that's what I want. That looks great. That's this nice little column vector with the square brackets. That's exactly what I want. But I don't want to type that every time. But I can't just do exactly what I did previously because anytime I make a column vector, the actual A and the B here, those are going to change. So really what I want to make is a new command that has sort of inputs that I can put two inputs in and it will spit it out to look like this. So let's go back up to where I was doing my new commands and I'm going to do a new command, but this time I'm going to use the first of these. Okay, so I need to say what I'm going to call it. How about call it CV for column vector? And then I have inside of these square brackets, I've got to put a parameter. I'm going to put the parameter two and that's going to indicate that it takes two different inputs. And then I'm going to go and copy and paste all of this stuff that I had before. So I'm going to take the whole begin B matrix to end B matrix thing and I'm going to put the whole thing in there. It's just I don't want a generic A, I want whatever my first input is. So I do the number sign 1, that indicates my first input. And then for B, that's going to be my second input, number sign 2. And then I'm going to come down here and say I could do 
backslash CV, my new name. How about one and two? And let's compile that. And what is it I have? Exactly what I want. A column vector with the one and two inside of it, but I have this nice little shorthand. You can get these macros to do just sort of all kinds of things. They're very powerful and they're going to allow you to actually make your life easier whenever you're doing something complicated over and over and over again. Just take the time to make a little macro for it. It's going to save it in the long run. So this video was part two of what's going to be at least four videos in this series on LaTeX. There are several more tips and tricks that are coming down the road for how to do more complicated LaTeX. Definitely check out all the links in the description, both to Overleaf, this wonderful software that allows us to so easily write in LaTeX and work so wonderfully in the cloud, but also to some of the documentation guides that I put down there as well. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a like for the YouTube algorithm. If you have any questions about LaTeX or want to see something specific in the next video, leave those down in the comments and we'll do some more math in the next video.